I'm a man, and I know that there are a lot of men around this country who right now are trying to keep a roof over their family's head, but in the interim, they can't pay child support. Is child support payments, I know it's not deferred, but just with this CARES Act, and I should have asked you this earlier in the, in the conversation, are there anything put in place for people who are, are, are struggling to survive but can't make the full payments on child support? Or does the interest keep adding up and they keep going into arrears and there's nothing put in place to help people who just legitimately can't pay? Right. That, that's going to be more of a... Um a question that they will have to kind of like contact their case manager or their court. Because the thing is a lot of collect, a lot of child support accounts don't automatically report to the credit bureaus. Right. So not every single child support account reports. It's usually when you go into default, like two or three times and you in arrears, that's usually when I see it, that it goes on after kind of like defaulting a few times on it. Um, but there is nothing as far as I know, as far as the protection with child support, which is unfortunate because obviously, you know, you're not working, uh, you lose your job. At that point is where you got to contact the court and let them know, hey, listen, I lost my job because of COVID. I can't make these payments. And, and you're going to have to keep that open communication if you have a relationship with, with the baby moms and say, hey, I'm out of work. Like, I, there's only so much I can do. Can you help me out here? And that's why having a great relationship, which I said in the beginning, open communication with all types of relationships can also protect your credit because you don't want to fall into a thing where it's like, now, damn, I wasn't able to make payments on my child support. Now it's on my credit. It's messed up. You know what I mean? There's definitely ways. I had, I had a few clients ask me that. Um, and, all, and all I've been telling them was to contact, like, you know, their, the court and the case manager and see if there's something they can do to prevent it from, from going on their credit report and or preventing the late payments from showing up if they're not able to make it because of unemployment. Got you. Let's say I'm in default um, and I've been in default for years. Mm -hmm. And going backwards into, into the conversation, you were saying, you know, Sean, it's just better to pay these people off, even if you can't get it removed from your report. Should I call and try to at least get the maybe interest removed or the principal reduced because it's so old and they'll just take, you know, they'll be willing to make a deal at that point? Or if they make a deal, does it reflect poorly or even more poorly on my credit report? So I always advocate 100% to settle the debt for less than what it is. Um, it's going to make or break somebody's situation because if you owe a $20,000 debt and they, they want to settle for 1200, which we've seen, take it. You know what I mean? Take that. But does that settlement. hurt me more? Does it hurt? Is it, is it, is it, it in any way hurt me? It does. So there's a verbiage that goes on the credit report that says settled for less than paid, you know, settled for less than paid in full or, you know, it'll have the verbiage on it and say settled for less, yeah, settled for less than paid in full or whatever. Um, that verbiage will be seen by other creditors, but if you don't got it, you don't got it. I always tell people settle because if you can save a few thousand dollars, few, you know, it's better. Yeah, the verbiage is going to be on the credit report. It's not so much going to hurt your credit score, but it is going to be on there as far as the verbiage on that on that account. But it's going to still look better than unpaid. You know what I mean? So the only thing that I tell people with settlements is that there's, there's a chance that they can issue what's called a 1099C, which is a cancellation of debt, and you would have to report that as income. Since you brought that question up, uh, a lot of people have to understand, let's say if you have a $10,000 credit card that, you, that, that, that was charged off or whatever the case is, you settled for $2,000. There is a possibility that that credit card company can issue you a 1099 and you would have to report that other $8,000 that you saved as income. You know what I mean? There's a high likely possibility of that happening. You would just have to ask the credit card company, hey, if I settle this debt, 
are you guys going to issue me a 1089 for the remainder of the balance? They're going to either say no or yes. If it's older, they might not do it. If it's newer, they might issue that 1089. And that just means that you got to pay taxes on it at the end of the year, but it's still going to be a lot less than you paying that full amount. We see people in our community all the time asking, you know, let's say they want to get a car, their first car. Um, they want to get into an apartment. Mm -hmm. They come and they ask you, can you co-sign for me? What are the risks of being that co-signee and does it affect my credit just as poorly as it would affect the person who actually took out the loan? I guess it, I'll end it there. Would it affect me the same way that it would affect them? Yes. Same way. Same way. So with that, what we usually tell people is, let's say um, I'm going to take me and my brother for, for an example, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say my brother comes up to me and says, hey, Jose, um, I want this car can you co-sign for me? Or I want this apartment, can you co-sign for me? And if I know that my brother's credit and his history is not really you know, good, you're better off by being the only person on that account and having your brother pay you or having my brother pay me. So for instance, I'm gonna use two examples, the apartment. Let's say if my brother's like, yo man, I really need, a, I really need to get this apartment, I got to move, whatever the case is. Can you co-sign for me? You can say no, but, and, and, and there's no other way, and it's your family, whatever the case is, and, and there's just, you know, you, you're guilty, and you, don't, you, you, know, you want to help them out. I always advocate for not co-signing, but if you have to, with all means, this is the way you should do it. You should tell them, all right, I'm going to be the main person on the apartment, and you're going to be the resident, because you know what's going to happen? Now you're, you know when it's being paid because your my brother is going to have to pay me and I'm going to pay. So I'm going to know like, yo, bro, the fifth of the month, you got to pay me. If you just have to be ready to make that payment if he's not going to make it. So when you co-sign or when you're a co-borrower, co you have to assume responsibility. So before you co-sign for your sibling or whatever, you have to know, all right, and just in case he doesn't make the payment, I got to be ready to make it. But the, the, the thing where it's going to protect you is, it's going to be better if you know that he doesn't pay you month one. Your brother's not going to tell you that he didn't make the payment. Next thing you know, mm -hmm. six months down the road, he's getting evicted. You guys are going to argue. He's going to, um, he, he's going to have some, a collection account on his credit report. You're going to get sued. Now you're screwed. You know what I mean? It's better to say, I'm the, I'm the owner of the apartment. Hey, man, listen, if you don't have my rent money by, by the next month, Sorry, bro, but I gotta rent it out of somebody else. I gotta, I, I can't have it because I don't, I can't keep making these payments for you. And then now you could rent it out to somebody else, or tell them, hey, listen, if you get a roommate, you guys can split the split the payment, whatever the case is. You'll be better in that situation. Now, with the apartment, and the thing is, if your credit is better than my brother's, if my my credit, it's a less um, less secure deposit usually, right? Because they base secure deposit off of credit. So if his credit is bad and my credit is good and I'm the co-signer, they're still going off of his credit for the secured deposit. So now he's paying more. So, hey, listen, I'm going to do, I'm going to save you 3000 2000 whatever it is, but make the payments to me and I'll make them. The same thing for the car. If my brother wants a car and he's like, yo, can you co-sign for me? I'm going to say no. I'm going to get the car under my name because it doesn't matter whether you co-sign or not, it's still going to go on both of your credit report, right? So you can say, all right, I'm going to get the car. My credit is better, so I'm going to have less interest, less down payment. My brother will give me the money, and then I'll make the payment. God forbid my brother is not able to pay it. Now I can sell the car. You know what I mean? I can sell the car and be good, and then my relationship with my brother is still intact, and it's not as bad because now he's not going to tell you that he's not making payments, especially if you're not up to it. Now you, next thing you know, you have a repo and an eviction, your credit is screwed because of somebody else, which you don't want. You know what I mean? I know that's a long explanation for it, but that's how I like to explain no, it. No, I, 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 I love it. I, I, I love that you are given this much insight. Yeah. I love it. What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. 
If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.